for me, speaker design, cabinet design has always been really daunting. Um, have you had formal training or did you just sort of pick it up? You know, I, no, I haven't had any formal training. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I have a, a straight A student in college. I went for one semester, took two classes and dropped out of digital electronics and calculus and never went back. I, and that's as far as I got. Learning, he taught me how to build speakers, it was trial and error. And there's actually, if you look up, um, if you do a Google search on rat sound evolution, an old page on the old rat uh, site will come up and kind of show the mindset, the thought of like first wedges and how we came up with the second, they sounded bad. And basically we build it, test it, sound it, find out the part we like, keep those, rebuild with a change. Is that it right there? Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. it. So I'll put a link to this into the description for anybody who wants to check it out. Yeah, that kind of goes through the mind, the, the thinking of um, how we went from, you know, just starting out with just regular speakers and realizing that most people were doing horn-loaded stuff for live in order to get volume, then realizing horn-loaded sounded bad, then wondering why why aren't concerts done with a bunch of studio monitors sounded good, yeah. concerts sounded bad. Why don't they do concerts with a whole bunch of studio monitors? Just stack them all up. And then you learn that they all interfere and the phasing. Yeah. But you have mentioned actually in some of your previous interviews that in the past it was trying to make a bad system sound good. Now we are in the age of having a stack of studio monitors, right? Yeah. Acoustics, K2, K1 rigs. Um, they sound great, just don't make them sound bad. Um, what yeah, yeah, what yeah. was it that took us from that place to where we are now? The evolution, the, the power, the watts per rack space has been a huge stepping stone. A uh, huge, because, uh, you know, like uh, DC-300s, when I first started, DC-300 was a viable amp. And that was, you know, and 8 ohms, 150 watts per channel and to stereo, 300 watts and four rack spaces or three rack spaces, you know, so you get 100 watts per rack space. And now, um, you know, you look at like these PowerSoft X4s and they're 20,000 watts per rack space. So there's, it's like watts per rack space almost moves at the same pace as, um, as uh, memory for computers. So you can fit more in less space and so just the logistics of getting everything from place to place really yeah. allowed us to do that. Yeah, just having, I mean, before the most power you can get out of something required a massive amount of uh, dead weight to get 500 watts. Now you get 500 watts out of something and you can hold in the palm of your hand. And then um, improved technology on speakers. The neodymium magnet has been uh, revolutionary for it. And um, as has the new adhesives that don't catch on fire <laughs> and bonding technologies to stop voice coils and thermal dissipation and... Uh, robotic manufacturing to keep voice coils aligned and precision. So there's been a lot of it, speaker, the speaker cones of today are absolutely amazing. Uh, the mechanics and electro, all of it is um, really allowed uh, a studio monitor type design, which is fairly inefficient with the speaker mounted on the baffle to get so much more volume out of that and have a good sounding thing get loud. Whereas before we had these smaller amps, lower power speakers, and we'd use big horns to gain efficiency. And the advantage of that is you could get a lot of volume out of not much power and a fairly, uh, not a lot of speakers, but you with an acoustic uh, waveguide or acoustic horn, you don't get something for nothing. You never get something for nothing in audio. Um, so as you increase the efficiency, you reduce the bandwidth. So yeah. if you put a nice big horn on something, it's really loud over a narrow range. And if you don't put a, if you use something that's a baffle reflex, then you can get a lower volume over a wider range. I guess to envision it, and I haven't really, I don't know if I've covered this anywhere, to envision the difference between a bass reflex design, we have a speaker exposed to the air versus a horn loaded, you could envision like hanging a sheet in a room, uh, uh, just a sheet supported by the top, um, just dangling there. And if you wanted to uh, create a representation of a 
studio monitor or a speaker mounted on the baffle, you take your hand and punch it. And that's the amount. And you can imagine, you kind of visualize that. You see a small part of the sheet pushing forward and the rest of it not moving very much. You know, if you just hit it an inch or so. Uh, a horn, you would take a cone, a big paper or cardboard cone and attach it to your hand and then hit it. And you could see that you could move a lot more of the sheet with the cone than you could with just your hand. On the other hand, if the cone was really big, it'd be hard to move that cone really fast. Yeah, and I see. You'd yeah. And you wouldn't be able to go pop, 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 pop. You'd have to go pop, pop, and as it got bigger and heavier. So the cone, that would limit your high frequency response, but you'd move more air um, and you'd lose some of the articulation. So horns kind of act like acoustic transformers. They help the motion get commu connected to the air better, but the more efficiently you connect it, the narrower the bandwidth. You lose low frequency determined by the size of the mouth of the horn and you lose high frequency because the, it's not amplified the same as the low frequency. Very interesting. For that size horn.